live. Okay. <laughs> Get a better angle. I had like a lot of like top heavy. I just like. <laughs> Before anybody asks, it's just I have like a I have acne on my nose. I'm not like. Oh no. Maybe Cronenbergian. Like that's something. a very unpleasant place to have acne. No, I look like Rudolph the fucking reindeer, but you know here we are. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, having the microphone close to you would be nice, Zach. Dumb fuck. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're good. You dumb piece of shit. The micro. This, this is how your dad raised you. <laughs> <laughs> to talk to a microphone that is afar. Oh my god! All right, we're all gonna have some laughs, y'all. It's gonna be a fun time. Here we go. <laughs> In three, two, one. And welcome to episode 432 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with Andrew Swafford. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about movies that we saw this week in part one. Uh, a lot of, I think, all new releases. All new releases. All new releases. We're getting hip with the zeitgeist. <laughs> And uh, and then in part two, we're going to be continuing our Ernst Lubitsch series with 1942's To Be or Not To Be. A great movie. Awesome movie. All right. Podcast is over, y'all. <laughs> um, but yeah, got a lot. I got a lot of new stuff. Um, a couple of these. So not a couple of these. One of the movies we're going to talk about, we saw at TIFF and we got mm -hmm. all those TIFF review guys on the website. So go over to the website and. We won't we won't reveal it. It'll be a surprise. But you know, you'll get to that part and you'll be like, oh, I know that one. A you'll mystery, perhaps. Yeah. Where stuff comes out. It's like clue for those detectives in the audience. Yeah. If you can <laughs> if you figure it out, comment below. <laughs> like and subscribe. <laughs> All right, whatever. Um Speaking of mysteries, the first movie I got for us is Confess Fletch. Mm. Um, this is like a remake of the Fletch movies with Chevy Chase. Um, oh, it's a remake? I thought it was like a continuation. I don't know. I don't give a shit. Um, <laughs> I haven't watched any of them. So. I don't. I haven't either. I don't really care. Um, this one stars though John Hamm. So they were like, let's find somebody who's you know, attractive and funny and not a total asshole like Chevy Chase. Mm. Um, that was the big change. And uh, Fletch is like, I don't really know how to describe him. He's like a detective, but was also like a investigative journalist. Hmm. And so like they hire him. So I don't know, maybe there's a whole Fletch back, you know, backstory I'm missing from. Oh, I think there's the, a backstory from the 1980s that I should watch, but don't care. So, Seems like such an odd thing to uh, to bring back into the cultural zeitgeist. I think it's a strong dad movie from the 80s. Yeah. Like, I think, I think even though the dads were younger, the young dads really latched on to Fletch, and it's like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's, that's one. Though this one was marketed in probably one of the worst ways possible in that Nobody knew this came out, and then it just kind of dropped. And moral of the story is, it's pretty fun though. I liked it actually. It's it's a it's a it's a nice little movie. Um, yeah. So who gives a shit who Fletch is? Uh, John Hamm. He, he needs should. to confess. He needs to confess. <laughs> um, so you meet you meet our 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 our, our dashing our dashing detective Fletch. Um, he goes to this uh, this this townhouse, this condo in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, when he gets there, he like sees like a note and stuff. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. Like he's he's going to be staying at this place. And then he goes into another room and just sees this woman's dead body just lying there. So then, you know, he calls the cops and the cops immediately see him as the prime suspect of person who murdered this woman because 
that was in his the condo that he was renting. And then it backs up a little bit, a little flashback, and he's in uh, he's in Italy with just this obnoxiously attractive woman played by Lorenza Izzo, <laughs> which then I was thinking about our Eli Roth discussion from a few weeks ago, and I'm like, how the fuck did Eli Roth pull Lorenza Izzo? Because she's absurdly attractive. Is that not also true for John Hamm? He's also he's kind of he's he's kind of like he's got like this like you know like like old hot like Gary Cooper James Stewart like just kind of like the suave like the suave well put together dad energy that you're kind of like yeah I could see why you'd want to fuck him um <laughs> I get it and so uh, anyway so they start they, they start banging and she also hires him to find like this stolen art. Uh, collection from her like super rich father and you have like you know so you have like his father or her father and then you have her father's new wife who's played by marcia uh gay harden who's also italian which is kind of strange but whatever um and so it's this all just like this random kind of mystery where fletch is just like walking around and like a button down with jeans and just kind of putting his hands in his pocket and she's like oh well this is a this is a whole caper. Um, <laughs> and so the uh, Roy Wood Jr. is playing the um, the detective that's <clears throat> uh, watching Fletch uh, in this murder case. He also uh, is dealing with this uh, professor slash art dealer played by Kyle McLaughlin, who's like a... Um, who's like a germaphobe also. And it's always nice to see Kyle <laughs> McLaughlin. A germaphobic professor slash art dealer. It's is a, a lot great of, role for Kyle McLaughlin, right? And he's he's super fun in it. Like he just you know, he's having a good time. But oh, and then also John Slattery shows up. So shout out to Mad Men. And you have like one scene where John Hamm and John Slattery are like getting a beer because John Slattery is like this ex or this newspaper editor that worked with Fletch. And it's great. Like they are immediately like, like bouncing off each other. It's fun. Um, I didn't do a good job of just, but I, I mean, I did my best job at, at describing the plot because it is, it's just kind of like, it's very kind of just like rolling, rolling with the waves. You know, this isn't, this isn't like knives out. Like this isn't mm -hmm. Agatha Christie. Like it's not trying to like go, Oh, let's connect all these like pieces. It's very, just very like laid back. And it's kind of almost, like okay like the crime kind of happened and they solved it and it's like all right well let's you know it's thursday now see ya <laughs> <laughs> um and i appreciated that <laughs> um it's directed by the guy who did um it was it is it just it's adventure adventure land super bad uh day trippers oh um, yeah. greg matola um it's kind of but it's nice like John Hamm's like, very, like this is finally like a movie role where he just kind of mm -hmm. is very comfortable and is able to like be funny, but not like over the top funny and then be kind of like, you know, engaging without or not have to like, he, every time I see him in a movie, he's like trying to overact and you're like, dude, um, and this one, he's very like natural in it. Um, you get all these kind of like goofy characters who show up like at one point Fletch is, um, interviewing uh this neighbor of the guy who owns the condo who he's staying at um and the neighbor is played by uh annie mamolo from bridesmaids and just the entire time she's just like the epitome of chaos energy and like she's like like lighting pans on fire and like it's just like there's fires like erupting in her apartment and like glass is <laughs> breaking and like she's like touching near the glass at one point she's like cutting stuff and like cuts part of her finger off and just goes, oh and like or no not cuts part of her, she cuts her hand and so then her hand is just like streaming with blood and he's like Wait, oh, what what level yeah. of reality are we operating on in this movie i was under the impression <laughs> it was very grounded <laughs> It's kind of grounded, but it's also just like manic to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, and no, it's great. And she's like cutting stuff in her hand, and her hand is just bleeding. And she's just like continuing to like tell this innate, you know, asinine story to Fletch while she's like wrapping her hand up and shit. Um, it's just like I don't know. I like appreciated how un um, unambitious this movie was. 
<laughs> for like all like like how much people love like the puzzle box mysteries this is like the antithesis of that hmm. and uh, i enjoyed it um and like i said i got this i, I liked staring at lorenza is she's really hot and uh john ham's super fun and that's confess fletch i think it's a fun time did you <laughs> enjoy it more than the uh the mysterious unnamed mystery we will talk about later no but it, that, you know like i said it's different things yeah it's this one's very i think this one for like a movie that got tossed on vod that i don't think again nobody really asked for a fletch continuation <laughs> remake or whatever like for all of those those things like it's a pleasant surprise you're like oh this is not as bad as what you would think it is i wonder if greg matola grew up watching the fletch movies and he was just like yeah i want to make one of those that's a good way of describing it matt lynch on on letterbox diet soderberg it's diet soderberg. <laughs> what's the platform it's on um, I watched it, uh, by pirating it, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, it's on VOD. It seems like one that'll be on like a Hulu or something at some point. It'll be, it'll be on all the streamings, all the streamings soon. And all so when streaming. it is, when it is like, if you see it, it's, it's, it, you could spend the worst hour and 40 minutes like this next movie that I'm talking about. Yeah. Let's get into it. The menu. Um, so the menu is uh, directed by Mark Malad. He's known for directing television, which if you watch this movie, you can tell. <laughs> um, uh, he's directed episodes of Game of Thrones and Succession. And what's the other what's the other TV show he directed? Oh, this is just this is just movies. He directed o Ollie G, I guess. Hmm. He directed What's Your Number with Anna Ferris and Chris Evans. People, fans. I would watch that combo. Um, I haven't, but I would. Anyway, so the the menu, uh, it's uh, it's also kind of in like it's very much in a eat the rich uh, vein. Hmm. Um, a a number of uh, very wealthy. Um, individuals there's a, a very famous food critic there's a like a kind of um not necessarily i'm trying to think of like kind of a good like a nice not necessarily like jeff bezos like you know <laughs> elon musk level rich but like um just one of those like kind of silent rich couples like this guy who's just very very wealthy Are they old um, money yeah, John Leguizamo plays like this very famous uh, actor. You have these hedge fund guys. Um, and then you have Nicholas Holt and Anya Taylor-Joy. And you don't really know. All you can tell is that uh, Nicholas Holt is very, very, very into like food and food culture specifically. And Anya Taylor-Joy, uh, you can't really tell if they've been dating for for a long time or not you know not very long at all like what what it is but he's like she she's going with him as as his date to this reclusive island which actually shout out to savannah is asaba island right off the coast um and uh to eat at this restaurant uh where this this chef played by ray fines um has prepared like this incredible menu and it's one of these things where it's like oh my gosh you pay like you know a bajillion dollars a head and it's this amazing dinner oh my goodness and so um yeah this movie sucks um it's not good uh and it, you know why it's not good because it literally tells you between the between 10 to 15 minutes in the movie what the fuck this movie is about it seems and like a movie that has a twist but it, it tells you the it twist. Twists, it twists you at ten minutes, and you're like, "Oh, okay. Well, maybe it's." And it's like, "Oh no, we have thirty more. We have an hour and a half more of this. It's <laughs> not going to change. It's literally just going to do what it told us we were going to do at the 10, 15 minute mark, and then nothing is going to deviate from that, and the movie's just going to end." 
Well, if the movie spoils itself in the first 10 minutes, I feel like we can also spoil it. We're doing what that right twist? here. Spoiler yeah. t- spoiler warning, unless you're just a baby and you can't, like, I mean, come on. I don't know. You could figure this out by, like, five minutes of this movie. But pretty much you get there and the movie tells you, okay, so this this chef played by Ray Fiennes is planning to uh, serve this dinner and it's going to be very grotesque and shocking and all this stuff's going to happen. People are going to die. And at the very end, he's going to like blow up the whole restaurant and kill all the people. Hmm. Um, which I thought, so, so he didn't really specify, I'm going to blow up the restaurant and kill all the people at the beginning. That's what ended up happening. But, um, I thought, okay, so he's going to have, it's going to almost be like, like sinister Willy Wonka and he's going to have like different dishes you know curtailed to the people and is going to like kill them in different like very specific ways but no no it doesn't literally at one point they bring everybody outside and he makes all the men like run through the forest like run away and that these 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 other sous chefs and other kitchen professionals are going to like chase them and chase them down and so you're like oh there's gonna be like a somebody's gonna die out in the woods no literally all of them run get captured and then brought back and then they continue eating meals and i'm like what the fuck mm-hmm. is this movie about and the, i know what the movie's about the movie's about like you know the the gluttony of food culture and how people you know just want the looks and want the prestige and want just you know all this stuff it's not about you know, the process or, or the, what the food is saying or like uh, anything about the meal or the work put into it. It's it's about, you know, it's about all the glamour and glitz and all this kind of stuff. And you're like, that's cool. It, but it's sure. It's it, it's not that deep. It never <laughs> it never like it never, you know, moves past just got, kind of going. And these rich people, man, they don't appreciate what they're what they have. You know, they don't, appre- they're just, they're selfish. And you're like, yeah, okay. And then what? And they're like, but these rich people though, they're kind of <laughs> selfish. And you're like, okay, yeah. but And it's just kind of like, I described it while leaving. It was kind of like a, fre- a college freshman wrote an essay about like, you know, this is the culture we live in, man. Um, and then they made it into a movie, I guess. <laughs> Like that's the level of that's the level of of like complexity that you're getting in the menu is is a college freshman who watched a YouTube explainer of um you know some watched some explainer of like some lefty YouTube video essay explainer and was like oh yeah I figured out the world <laughs> um. So and if uh, Confess Fletch is a movie that is uh, maybe formally eclipsed by a movie we'll talk about later, maybe this is a movie that is thematically eclipsed by a movie we're going to talk about later. That's a good way of putting it, yeah. <laughs> no, this one, and the food doesn't even look good. I don't know. I, 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 was, kind of, I was kind of excited. I thought it was going to have a little bit more going. Like, Ray Fiennes is fine. Is, is, he's, he's fine. He's good. It's Ray Fiennes. Like, he's a good actor. He does a good job. Um. How's Anya Taylor Joy? She's solid. She's fine. She's she's working with what she got. <laughs> she's easily the most, you know, the most interesting character. She can, they kind of like veer off on, you know, her character it becomes more of like like uh cuz Ray Fiennes, you know, cont- I guess I guess Nicholas Holt was supposed to bring this other woman and then he changed last minute and brought Anya Taylor Joy. And it's I, I don't even want to get into her backstory because like pretty much she's like a she's like an escort and it's just like this whole like convoluted thing. Um but uh Ray Fiennes, his character at one point is just kind of like, you know, this is happening. You know, we we talked about how we're gonna kill everybody. This is happening. So like, do you wanna be on our side or do you wanna be on their side? Hmm. And she's like, and so then like Nicholas Holt's such an asshole that she's finally like, I'm just going to go be on your side, even though I don't know what the hell that means. Um, and yeah, I don't, it's just, it's, it's one of those movies that, you know, I'm sure people are listening and they're just like, fuck you, Zach, you don't know what you're talking about. But <laughs> this movie is so, this, this movie is saying something about culture. It's not you. It's not y'all. It's really, it's not that complex. It tells you, this is what we're going to do 15 minutes in. And then you have an hour and 30 minutes of movie left. 
and it never veers from that. And then it ends. And like, it's been so much fun since leaving the theater because every minute I've, I've been away from the theater after watching this, I've just thought about how terrible this movie is. It is becoming more and more fashionable to make eat the rich movies. Um, and I can't decide whether or not I think that that is good propaganda. Like it's good for that to kind of be out in, in the cultural mainstream or if it's just being recuperated um, and, and, you know, made toothless. This seems yeah. like it's toothless. This one's pretty toothless. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's kind of one of the, so it's, it's, it, I've been, I haven't, I'll me just preface that I haven't watched the show at all because I, I just, I don't really care about TV. Um, but people are really high on the Star Wars show Andor. Is it, I think it's Andor. Whatever. Man, who gives and, a shit? Right. I'm not about to watch a Star Wars show named Andor. Andor. Andor <laughs> what? Do something else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Man. I I hope it's really that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so like this, it, it's supposed to be like this very like anti-imperialist, um, like uh revolutionary like they're it, like it's being framed as this is not just like a star wars television series on disney plus <laughs> this is a this is like a complex you know breakdown of how to fight and and deal with fascism and like i mm. saw somebody also make a point like yeah but this is still coming from disney yeah so like i don't you know, trust them with that you like even though you can be like oh well no you know so the the show creator and all these people are doing you're like yeah but at the end of the day Disney's Disney's getting the money it's like I said to somebody with the Black Panther movie they're like no Black Panther it's important you know it's it's important for for black culture to have this and I'm like I mean I guess but also at the end of the day Bob Iger is getting the money from it you know yeah I mean Disney I, is banking on you saying it is important yeah it's important that, that I see this movie exactly so i'm just like you know so this that my, my main point is like yeah you can be like eat the rich but you know they're still you know they're kind of just going oh yeah no we suck anyway thanks for the check yeah so you know at least have something to say with it instead of a toothless mm -hmm. piece of shit movie like the menu the menu don't see it <laughs> um all right i've talked for a long time but we're going to yeah. talk about the Bans Banshees of Inna Sharon for a third time because it's our fucking podcast and we can do whatever the hell we want. <laughs> we can talk about the Banshees of Inna Sharon. I also remembered while you were talking about the menu and you know critiques of the uber wealthy that I also saw Tar. We could talk about Tar as if we have it. We've only talked about Tar once, so if you oh, like. okay. Well, let me very briefly chime in on the Banshees of Inna Sharon because right. I know you wanted to get into spoiler stuff on that movie um this i i like this movie a lot it's the new movie by mark mcdonough as people who listen to the show regularly have already heard twice now <laughs> uh zach but get over it zach did a great job summarizing the main premise of the the movie uh being about uh colin farrell and brendan gleason middle-aged dudes who have been drinking buddies together for years all of a sudden Brendan Gleeson wants to have a friend breakup with Colin Farrell and Colin Farrell takes that very hard and just insistently doggedly pursues him and asks why, 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 why can't we be friends? <laughs> uh, and that's pretty much the movie. Um, it does, as Zach said, go to some darker places than I was expecting it to go. Um, more violent places than I was expecting it to go. It, it is pretty, uh, there, there's images in it that I wouldn't have wanted to see uh just you know i'm not typing them into google images um but it's really good um and i think it might be martin mcdonough's best movie i don't know i i need to rewatch in bruges at some point it's yeah. way better than three little words outside of missouri um yeah michael and i when we talked about it because michael said the same thing and i'm 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 I'm, I, I don't think I can argue because Imbruge is, is incredibly entertaining, but it's also like this one has a little bit more. This one has a little bit more going on than right. Imbruge. And then three, uh, three, but I really, I, part of me wants to rewatch three billboards, even though it'll just verify that it's not good to me. I think that both three billboards and McDonough's other movie I haven't mentioned, Seven Psychopaths, they have this that's his brother almost. Oh, that's his brother? 
The second week, the second time in a row we've done this. Yeah, it's his brother. <laughs> I thought for sure Seven Psychopaths was Martin McDonough. Can we double check because I we I've have to heard... double check this. JK, Even if we Martin... double JK, it is Martin, Martin McDonough. McDonough. Okay. So point stands. What I was gonna say. <laughs> God damn McDonough's man. Yeah. Both in Bruges and Seven Psychopaths have this like almost Tarantino tendency to um dance across a line of like appropriateness or good taste. Um like the uh Peter Dinklage is in in Bruges, right? And there's a lot of humor about little people and yes, prostitution yeah. and things like that. And, you know, I don't have a vivid enough memory of that movie to be able to quote specific jokes to you. But um, my memory of it is that a lot of that stuff felt like it was trying to be edgy for edginess's sake. Um, and I think that, and there's, there's some stuff like that in, uh, in seven Psych psychopaths as well. This movie feels like it has sort of graduated beyond that desire to just kind of go for really low hanging uh, juvenile humor. Um, and instead the humor just kind of comes from the, um, I don't know, the, the mundanity of people's everyday interactions and awkward social uh, uh, conflicts. Um, and I also feel like it is, it, it does feel so real and so grounded despite the various places that it goes. Um this place feels like a real place, um, unlike Three Billboards, which doesn't feel like America at all. Um, I believe in a Sharon is a fictional island, though. Um, I Googled and did not find anything but the movie. Um, I want to live there, though. Yeah, I mean, it, it really captures the feeling of a, of a really small town uh, very well. Um, like a town where when people do have a friend breakup, they're just going to keep running into each other in public all the time because there's only so many places there are there's to go. There's literally like 10 people there. Yeah. Um, Which and then makes I get the friend breakup even better because it's it like, you like, what else are you going to do? You got nobody <laughs> else to talk to. Nobody has much going on. Nobody has a lot to do. Everybody's uh, at the bar at like two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> right. It's like, ah, uh, it's late enough to drink. I guess I'll go do that. Um, and I guess the only other thing I want to say about it is like, this movie has much more of a atmosphere to it than the other McDonough films. Um, and I don't know, maybe it was just because I saw it when I was a little sleepy and it was a late show, but I, I found myself almost in that, a picture pong where set the cool place of kind of, uh, floating in and out <laughs> of consciousness at parts of it, because it's just a very calm soothing movie like it's really funny it again has some violence in it but there's just kind of this permeating sense of like ease um just throughout the entire film i um, also have uh carter burwell who does the score he's done the score for a lot of um charlie kaufman movies but also coen brothers movies okay he, he yeah. kind of has like this very subtle but very like lyrical style it's nice yeah the score is really beautiful um a lot of bells if i'm remembering mm -hmm. correctly um so yeah it's just kind of this aesthetically um beautiful experience on top of being uh very entertaining and uh funny uh it it is a movie that i i can't imagine many people disliking i i think that People should definitely go see this if they haven't already. Uh, I, and I also, I still, I think that, um, what's his face? I think Barry Keegan's performance in this is like the town idiot kid might mm. be my, one of my, the best performances I've seen in a movie this year. It's he's maybe, really it's probably my favorite Barry Keegan role. Yeah, he's really good. Yeah, he's extremely good. Yeah. Uh, like, just so like, it, just like a, like, talk about just like capturing, just like getting in a role. A particular type of guy. Yeah, he is that type of guy. Did did you have anything else you want to talk about on this one before we abandon? No, it I think it's coming. I think it's going to be on HBO Max soon. Let me. Look. Oh, sweet. So I'm excited to rewatch it. Uh, I might toss some subtitles on. There. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, let me see. I think it's coming soon, so that people are like, "Oh, good, we'll have other, you know, more time for you all to talk about the Banshees of Minas Sharon." I'm going to be like, "Well." 
that's what's happening. Yeah, it's going to be on the what is it? The thirteenth. It'll be on HBO Max. So if you have not seen it, it'll be on HBO Max. You should watch it, and that'll be perfect. You can watch it with subtitles so you can understand (laughs) Irish people, which I don't know. I don't really have much challenge with. I guess it's kind of. I was thinking about it. I think Irish dialect is very similar to like Southern dialect and like really Mm. like deep, deep, deep Southern dialect where I think most people think you're just speaking gibberish and some, and I'm usually like, no, I understand what they're saying. (laughs) They say uh, feck a lot. I like that though, because it's not really (laughs) fuck. It's just fucking right. (laughs) (laughs) Just like it. That's a nice ring Um, to it. Did you want to mention anything about tar? Yeah, I will. I will talk about tar to the best of my ability. Um, this it's been a couple of weeks since I seen since I saw this. It was like the second week in November, so I'm a little fuzzy on the details. And this is a long movie with a lot of details. Um, but Tar is the new movie by Todd Field, who I know as the piano player Nick Nightingale in Eyes Wide Shut. I think that that's probably his most uh, Mm. famous thing he has done in the film world. But he's also made a bunch of uh, art house uh, uh, festival films in the past um, that I really don't know very much about. Uh, But uh, Tar is a movie about a conductor, um, Kate Blanchett, um, who's also one of the producers on this movie, uh, plays this celebrity conductor. And I don't know if there are actual celebrity conductors in real life. They mention Leonard Bernstein a lot. Um, so maybe that's, that's, yeah. that's the most recent celebrity conductor. That's we had. the guy. Leonard um, Bernstein. <laughs> um, George Gershwin. I don't know. But Blanchette is, um, she's a conductor specifically of, you know, really well-established classical music um i'm trying to remember who her main main uh composer is that she's really into is it mahler maybe mahler Um, (laughs) that tells you all you need to know (laughs) but yeah there's like a lot of conversations with between her and, and other characters about um more contemporary uh more experimental contemporary classical music um that she rejects because she wants to reinterpret the old stuff in a new way and and she is sort of standing in for um the old guard of an institution sort of needing to uh give way to to you know leave room for the the new the new uh up and comers those young um, conductors that are just yeah. flooding the streets <laughs> well i mean this is a movie about conducting but it's also not really a movie about conducting it's it's using the world of classical music as sort of a stand in for probably film primarily because that's the world that todd field knows um but i think you could sort of transplant any industry onto it um because all industries are going to have problems of uh, gatekeeping and and abuse and things like that. This is also kind of a Me Too movie in ways that I don't really want to spoil. Um, but it's a it's a movie with a lot of um, room to kind of play around plot wise. Um, Darren Hughes, friend of the podcast, um, wrote a really good review on Letterboxd where he was talking about enjoying the thought of Todd Field writing this thing and just kind of following whatever impulse uh, took him. Um, so it goes a lot uh, of different places plot wise, and, uh, there's kind of a lot of different levels of reality it's working on. Um, you're, you're kind of locked into, uh, Kate Blanchett's subjective experience. And, um, she has a lot of, uh, dreams and hallucinations and, um, things that, you know, you're not really sure if they're true or not. Um, which, uh, makes for an interestingly like low key surreal movie set in the world like this very uh, sterile world of classical music. Um, it also is potentially a detriment to the movie since it is um, a film about um, exploitation and abuse, um, and the perspective that we're centered on. Um, I could see someone arguing is like not the best perspective to center on. Um, but 
Uh, again, I can't really say a whole lot more about it without getting into spoilers. Um, I, I will say that I enjoyed uh, this movie. Like the, um, it, it is one that you're going to think about for for quite a while after watching it, and you're going to want to talk to people about. Um, I like a movie that um, sort of insists upon um, you mulling it over and picking it apart with people. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, this is not a movie that uh, particularly has has struck me in the way that it seems to have struck a lot of people. I think that this is the movie that um, won more awards at international festivals than, than any other movie this last festival season. Um, and it is not quite to that level for me. But I did think that it was very interesting. I liked the way that it kind of played with the runtime and um, and and played with like a lot of different modes uh, inside the movie, but still making it feel very cohesive. Um, but yeah, it's it's one that I can't. I I mentioned Banshees of Inisherin. This is a movie that like nobody's going to dislike. Tar is a movie that I feel like I can't say what way you're going to feel about it one way or the other. Whoever is listening, like everybody is probably going to have a slightly different take on this, especially because it is kind of a movie about uh, perspective and it's like offering all these different um, like pieces of evidence and perspectives for you to mull over. Um, so, you know, you're going to latch on to different things and, and find different things compelling or, or, or not, or uh, thoughtful or reprehensible or whatever. Um, it's, it's kind of trying to, to come at this issue from a lot of different angles at once. Um, and, I don't know. I, I wish that it was a little bit more focused, I think, but um, I, I do appreciate it for what it is, um, for how like weird and wild and ambitious of a, of a thing this movie is. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still waiting to see it. I played here for like 15, like 15 minutes. And then <laughs> they played the first eighth of the movie. Yeah. And they and were then like, right, it <laughs> time for Black Panther 2. <laughs> All right. Um, real briefly, we got we got some time. Um, we're going to talk about Glass Onion, a Knives Out mystery. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll say we saw both both of us saw this at TIFF. Um, we're going to get some. We're going to get kind of spoilery though. So if you have not watched it since it only played in like fifteen movie theaters, yeah, because Netflix is an asshole. Um, <laughs> You can go ahead and you know go to go to the show notes and click on the skip ahead to go to the conversation to, on to be or not to be. But um, uh, you know it'll be it'll be on Netflix at the end of the year. So um, it is also playing, I think, really wide for a week around Christmas. So people oh, will that, get a chance to see. Are it. they doing it again? I think so. Oh, okay. Well, I would be. They should just keep playing it throughout the whole month. But that's fine. Cool. <laughs> You know, let me don't, don't let me tell them the you know the the company how to make money. It's fine. Um, the glass onion and knives out mystery. Um, yeah, we talked. We kind of went over the plot last time. You have it's uh, the you have the returning character of Benoit Blanc, the detective played by Daniel Craig. Um, he gets uh, called into this um, friends friends vacation out to this remote island that's owned by um the elon musk's stand-in played mm -hmm. by uh edward norton and you have this this variety of different characters played by kate hudson and katherine hahn and dave batista and leslie odom jr and all these other folks um and then one played by janelle monet who kind of is um on the outs with this friend group but was clearly very instrumental into how um uh edward norton's character generated and gained his wealth um and so it's supposed to be like this this kind of seclusion vacation they're going to play this little murder mystery and so because they're going to play this little murder mystery they invite you know they bring along the fa very famous detective and then bum 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 real mystery real murder happens <laughs> um and uh we were both real positive on this i mean that's i'm kind yeah. of i'm kind of bummed it didn't play anywhere near here in theaters because i would have liked to have seen it in a theater um yeah. it was fun to see it the time I did, you know, with a crowd with like a public screening crowd at TIFF. Um, the guy next to me was really into it. He'd going, Whoa. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know, like, where to start with spoilers. Hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, you just name people like things that happen. Like, I don't know. I'm just kinda... here's a here's a very spoilery question. Well, maybe it's not that spoilery. Um, do you think that Knives Out three, which is almost definitely going to happen? I think, do you think it will. Netflix will... bought two. So, yeah, they'll be. Oh, OK. Um... Do you think Janelle Monet is going to be the lead of Knives Out three? Instead of uh, Daniel Craig. Instead of Daniel Craig. I think they signed with Daniel Craig for the. Oh, they did sign with Daniel Craig. Yeah. I think that's the thing. Maybe they can be little partners together. I don't know. That could be cool. They could have a little Batman Robin dynamic yeah. going on. Um, um, no, I don't know. But I mean, you would think the same thing with like Ana de Armas's character from the first one. I think that Janelle Monet is kind of just playing that role. That's true. From yeah. The first one. Mm-hmm. Um, but Janelle Monet is really good. So her, you know, I guess this is kind of the spoilery thing. You think her character is just kind of like this on the outs, bitter, uh, or at least that's how she's portrayed this on the outs, bitter um, ex friend and in kind of colleague of this group um, who, you know, is just kind of calling them out as all these phonies who are just nice to Edward Norton because of his wealth and his power. They don't really, you know, they they actually all hate him, but you know he's super wealthy and super powerful. So they're like, oh okay, and that's why he's an Elon Musk standing. Um, <laughs> but uh, but then it, it you know it, in, it but then her character um, her character dies, and you're like, what? Wait, no, wait, no, no. Her character doesn't die. Well, her character does die. There's a there's a period of time before. where you think her character dies. Yeah, but her character. The, the character that worked with them actually did die. Yes. There's, there's twists upon twists in this movie. Yeah. Her, I'm trying to, it's been a, it's features. been a few months. So I'm trying to also recollect, yeah. re- recollect what happened. Um, and so Janelle Monet's character is actually the twin sister of the person who worked with Edward Norton's character and all them. Correct. Um, and she's kind of just coming back to get, kind of uh, pretty much get vengeance for her sister that her her, that 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 character kill themselves was that or they just die i think they got killed by somebody in the elon musk circle because she was going to that's uh, right that like she actually came up with his big uh uh profitable idea oh no elon musk guy killed her yeah that's right sorry we're 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 all piecing it together online (laughs) um but uh I don't know. It's fun. It, the, it's the really twist fun. Work, the twist works. The I I st- I'll have to rewatch it again. I still think that it takes a little while to get in. And like the first part of it is fun because you have Dave Bautista being Joe Rogan, which is really entertaining. Mm-hmm. Um, and all these characters are just kind of loopy, and they're it's a good actors like Catherine Hans, just great all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but once you get into like twist mode, I think it pays off. And this is you know you're referencing it to a degree. Um, when talking about um, confess Fletch and, and the menu, especially the menu is like this kind of thematic eat the rich type movie. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this is one both in both knives out movies that they kind of sticks the landing, not perfectly, but a little, a lot more cohesively than yeah. something like the menu does. I think this, this movie has a much more, and I haven't seen the menu of course. So uh, I, I guess I'm projecting a little bit. On I explained movie, the whole movie but... to you. So you're good. That that sounds kind of flat, like rich people bad, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think that what Ryan Johnson has done here is gotten real specific um, about the specific the ways in which um, these particular types of rich people are bad. Like he's all these characters are kind of standing in for different like contemporary celebrities um or at least at least celebrity types um if they're not a specific person um and i think that he just has a really good read on all their idiosyncrasies and and the various ways in which they are um like enabled and um like latched on to by people beneath them um the the whole movie sort of being a a huge joke about elon musk's ego 
um, and and his inability to uh, like and, and like surrounding himself with yes men who will only um, kind of uh, uh, feed his worst impulses because they want a little bit of the money that he has um, feels like both very um, apt and also more apt oh. by the day as he oh, continues as some, to grab Twitter as people who. Yeah, as people who watched this before he took over Twitter, it has yeah. aged beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> it really has. Yeah, um, it, like honestly, like I'm glad I saw it at the time I did because it makes this whole thing like, oh, man, good job on on this one, Ryan Johnson. Yeah, I mean, I think that Ryan Johnson has been accused of just sort of like MSNBC style liberal pandering um, in the way that he handles uh, like political or contemporary political issues here um but that and being like very twitter aware like being very online aware he's very online he probably should log off um as we all should as we all should i logged off i feel much better after having logged off um but i think that there is some value to like keeping tabs on all of these little um interrelated uh you know personal dramas and vendettas that are leading to these like larger civilizational shifts um and i i admire and and appreciate ryan johnson for for documenting them um and and putting them in the supremely entertaining um and and well-filmed format um it probably is going to be a movie that will age poorly like uh, like long term will age poorly just because some of the references will be lost to time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I was reading a, a, a review from Peter Labuza today who said that that was true for a lot of Agatha Christie's stories too. Like people just kind of skim over a lot of the contemporary details that don't really land for them anymore, but the, the mystery itself still functions. And I think this is a really functional mystery or like mysteries, three or four contained within each other in, in ways that doesn't feel like it's just this cobbled together anthology thing, but a a really intricately designed, um, you know, nesting doll or or glass onion uh, wow. that that all just like comes together as a piece really well. I think um, the I do agree that the beginning is probably the weakest part of it, specifically the ways in which they try to nod to COVID. Um, yeah. But when it's just that's these, what we'll these age characters figure. bantering back and forth, um, like I think that stuff is really funny, entertaining, even if we're not in full on mystery mode yet. Yeah, the COVID stuff will age real. I think any COVID stuff is going to age very, very poorly mm-hmm. in any movie and TV show ever. But, um, I, I, but I also think, you know, I, I agree. I think you can kind of look past some of that stuff in order to, in kind of, you know, I think it'll age better than we think. I mean, Get Out, you could say, it, I think is a movie that'll play really well, but also pl- like has moments of it that are specifically geared to the zeitgeist moment. Like, you know, just the whole, the whole running joke of Bradley Whitford's character saying that he would vote for Obama a third time. Mm-hmm. Like that feels like, a, a, you know, a, making fun of a very specific type of, political person Mm -hmm. um in this age who who knows if like that's something that'll read in like 20 30 years but yeah who -hmm. knows if we'll be here in 20 to 30 years so that's you know just kind of roll with it (laughs) because you know perspective climate change yeah um all right we're gonna take a quick break and then we're gonna answer the great question of to be or not to be after this that is the question it is the question I was so proud of my, I was, I thought of that joke when I was like, I'm going to ask people to be on the episode. I'm going to be like, to be on the episode. That is the question. I was like, that's so funny. (laughs) I'm so proud of myself. All right. You said this was Cinematary episode 432. 432. Give me just a second, and uh, I'll be right back. Okay.
Coop. Coop. Cooper. Cooper. Cooper, come to the computer. Cooper, come to the co Cooper. Cooper, look at me. Look at me. I'm on to your right. To your right. <laughs> look at me. To your right, Cooper. Cooper. To your right. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Where are you going? Look at me. Stare at me. Oh, man. Oh, you had the headphones on. Dang it. He couldn't hear me. No, I could not. No, I was trying to get him to come and look at me on the camera. Could you not see her? Jenny, come here. She don't want to hang out. I was like Jermaine Clement and what we do in the shadows. I was like, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> See me. <laughs> I rewatched uh, Hunt for the Wilder People the other day with some yeah. people because they had not seen it. And I realized I hadn't watched it since 2016 when it came out. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so sad that after he made that movie, Taika Waititi died. Yeah. Unfortunately, he really, uh, he really is gone. Like they were like, oh, this is a really we'll see Taika Waititi again. They were like, this was a really fun movie. Why doesn't he make these anymore? I'm like, that's the big question. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. this is I don't know how like... involved in the show he is, but the show is very good. Oh, what we do in the uh, shadows? What we do in the shadows. Yeah. I think he's like a producer, but yeah, no, the show's great. Mm -hmm. I like the show. I like that, too. But, you know, he's dead now, so that's too bad. <laughs> he's off making Disney and Nazi movies. so And not Nazi movies that are good like this one. <laughs> bad nuts. No the opposite of what we're talking about here. Oh, all right. Oh, the cat's going to come back. All righty. Let me grab her. Oh. This oh, that's is not Jenny. Cooper. This is Ginny. I was I was talking to her like it's Cooper. She's a, yeah, she's a friend's cat. Look at me. <laughs> Look at me. Look at me. There you go. <laughs> you kind of got it. All right. Here we go. In three, two, one. And we're back with part two of episode 432 of Cinematary. In this part, we're going to be continuing our Ernst Lubitsch series with 1942's To Be or Not To Be. Directed by Ernst Lubitsch from a script by Edwin Justice Meyer and Melchor Lingle. The film stars Carol Lombard, Jack Benny, Robert Stack, Felix Brassart, and Sig Ruman. Acting couple Joseph and Maria Tura are managing a theatrical troupe when the Nazis invade Poland. Maria is having an affair with Lieutenant Sobinski, who suspects Professor Selecki is a Nazi spy. When Selecki is in possession of a list of members of the Polish resistance, the Tura's company takes action. Using their skill for impersonation, Joseph and company must confuse the Nazis and stop uh, Selecki from handing over the list. Uh, to be or not to be marked Carol Lombard's final film. Shortly after production was completed, Lombard embarked on a war bond tour and was killed in an airplane crash in January of 1942. Wow. Many reviewers echoed the sentiment of the Variety Review, which noted, quote, it's an acting triumph for Miss Lombard, who delivers an effort uh, effortless and highly effective performance that provides memorable finale to a brilliant screen career. Uh, Lubitsch had originally wanted to cast Miriam Hopkins in the role of Maria Tura, but when Hopkins displayed uh, dissatisfaction with the role, Carol Lombard urged her to withdraw and was subsequently cast in her stead. Uh, according to a Hollywood Reporter news item, Miklos Rocha was originally assigned to compose the score. 
um, which, you know, dude's awesome. Uh, the script was developed both by Lubitsch and Hungarian writer Michor uh, Lengiel, whose original story was the basis for Lubitsch's previous film, Nanachka, in 1939. The earlier film garnered uh, Lengiel a Best Original Screenplay nomination. It lost to Gone with the Wind. Uh, Lubet, uh, Lubitsch and Lingiel's comedic material was then put into script form by New York playwright Edwin Justice Mayer. Um, it was in a it was a historically fearful time in early or in late 1941 and early 1942, and audiences were not prone to easily accept a comedy at that time. Uh, things happening at this time included the uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Battle of Moscow, the German invasion of Russia on the Eastern Front. Um, the torpedo sinking of Brit uh, Britain's Royal Navy aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal by a German U-boat, deportations of thousands of Jews to concentration camps, the spread of fascism across Europe, and suicide uh, or, and Lombard's death. The, title, uh, the titles To Be or Not to Be, Hamlet's ex ex existential contemplation of suicide in the play that resonated throughout the script, could have been rephrased as a decision-making uh, assertion to ambivalent Americans. To act or not to act. Lubitsch was heavily criticized for, for producing a lighthearted film featuring Nazis in such irreverent lines as, quote, Oh, yes, I saw him in Hamlet once. What he did to Shakespeare, we, we are now doing to Poland. <laughs> but Lubitsch, a German refugee, argued that spoofing the Nazis was, the, was an act of patriotism. Although reviews of the film were mostly favorable, reviewers were critical of the farcical manner in which the Nazis were handled in the film. One review noted that, quote, this treats humorously of the Nazis at a time when the new war news is not funny, while others uh, variously noted that it is, quote, more grim than hilarious, and, quote, the tragic reality of Warsaw's situation is no laughing matter. Bosley Crowther of the New York Times noted that, quote, to say it is callous and macabre is understating the case. Mr. Lubitsch has an had an odd sense of humor in a tangled script when he made the film. Lubitsch replied in a rebuttal to Crowther's review that, quote, I had made up my mind to make a picture with no attempt to relieve, uh, relieve anybody from anything at any time. Dramatic when the situation demands it, satire and comedy whenever it is called for. One might call it a tragical farce or a farcical tragedy. I do not care and neither do the audiences. When the Philadelphia Inquirer reporter also criticized Lubitsch for his, quote, callous, tasteless effort to find fun in the bombing of Warsaw and insinuated that this might be due to Lubitsch's Berlin heritage, Lubitsch responded to her in a letter. He suggested that her insinuations were propagandist by nature and based on, quote, false facts, fake news, <laughs> World War II edition. Um, in the film, he noted the bombing of Warsaw is shown, quote, in all seriousness, the commentation under the shots of the devastated Warsaw speaks for itself and cannot leave any doubt in the spectator's mind what my point of view and attitude is toward these acts of horror. What I have satirized in this picture are the Nazis and their ridiculous ideology. Also criticized for his portrayal of the Poles, uh, Lubitsch noted that he portrayed the Poles as courageous people. On that mm -hmm. note, let's talk a little bit about To Be or Not To Be. Yeah. One of my all-time faves. Love it's a fantastic movie. movie. Just a just a banger all around. Like, Quentin Tarantino thought he could do it. He couldn't. <laughs> Is it your favorite Lubitsch? Yeah, probably my favorite Lubitsch. Mm -hmm. It's a movie that I think a lot of people start with, with Lubitsch. It's, it's a good The, it's the a good one starter. that has, uh, for a long time, it was the only, like, you know, nice Blu-ray in the Criterion Collection uh, by Ernst Lubitsch. Um, but it's one that I think is probably more powerful if it's not the first one of his you see. Um, because for all the, the stuff in the notes that you're reading, Zach, about it being this really farcical comedy that makes light of World War II, like it's, it's way heavier than a lot of his stuff. Um, and I think those tonal shifts feel um, more pronounced if you know what his usual tone is. Yeah. It's, it's just strange movie too, because like it, it starts out and it has like these, the first 10 or so minutes of it are just like fucking hilarious. You have Jack yeah. Benny just in full neurotic mode. Um, my favorite part of uh, is when uh, they get the news that Germany's invaded Poland 
and Jack, and this is just after the guy has interrupted his uh, his Hamlet's uh, soliloquy yeah. for the second time, and he comes in, he goes, "It's a conspiracy." And the guy goes, it's not a conspiracy; it's a crime. He goes, "It's a crime too." Walking out on me for two straight nights. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and and it's like it's just really, but then like right after that, it switches to like it comp- it almost becomes like a completely different movie for a little while. Yeah. Um, because then you get caught up in like this 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 naval uh, fighter who then goes to Britain, who meets up with this professor, and the professor's coming back to Warsaw, and like you get like all stuck in this intrigue, and you completely leave like the uh, right. Carol Lombard and, and Jack Benny character for a long time, but then it comes back and it immediately picks up. It's uh, but you know, it's yeah. just, I don't I don't know if it's many movies could p- pull off becoming something completely different for like ten minutes. Yeah, one of the quotes that you read described the the script as tangled and it it does feel like a tangled script to me but not in a way that is in any way negative like this is just a very unconventional story very unconventional story structure um another thing that you didn't mention was that we actually open in a play um, Mm -hmm. and you don't know that you're in a play until well somebody calls cut it opens yeah. it opens out, like outside of the play and then goes into the play and then that that makes you understand why oh the, right because because yeah. initially it's it's um the character walking around as hitler in warsaw and people are just gawking at him here's how and then, hitler came to warsaw yeah, yeah and then and then the narrator like sets it up as like back in berlin you know back in berlin or whatever and you think you're like in the nazi like offices but it's actually this this farce that they're putting on and then he challenges that he looks like Hitler so much he could walk on the street and nobody would notice him mm-hmm. and then it cuts back to people gawking at him and the girl comes up and asks for his autograph as an actor right good you um, know good little bit and in the the scenes where we are actually seeing the play it's not it's not really shot like you're watching actors on a stage it's shot like a movie Mm-hmm. Um, so you're kind of in this as an audience member in this weird space where you're like not sure which narrative is like the narrative and like how how real are the images we're looking at at any given moment but Mm -hmm. um it just kind of keeps going down new avenues um it is this shaggy dog story that i I would say doesn't really um settle down into one particular plot until the second half um when the theater troupe decides they're going to use their acting prowess to trick the nazis Mm -hmm. Uh, But like there's this really long, complicated setup to that. Mm -hmm. Um, And and like all of those different moving pieces kind of serve as different sources of humor once he kind of just lets it lose. Well, because you have like this whole we have to we have to con the Nazis and kill this professor plot line. And then in the middle of the plot line, you have Jack Benny, who's constantly doing like whatever the hell he wants and and it becomes and, and you know he makes it a whole like oh this guy's cheating on my wife my wife's right. cheating on me with this guy <laughs> like in, in the middle of like no you need to like get the get the documents from this guy and kill him so that mm-hmm. you know he won't turn in the polish resistance to the nazis and he's like right this guy's sleeping with my wife mm-hmm. <laughs> um and it makes me laugh every time i love jack benny in this movie yeah, the the to be or not to be joke of him coming on stage, starting the soliloquy, and then the the officer standing up and leaving is just hilarious because it's all it's three hilarious. times it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious all three times, and it's hilarious in different ways all three times. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's the same punchline every time, but it's a different setup, and it's like adding to the joke that existed before. I, I guess I'm just describing what a running joke is in general. Well, but it's, man, it, Ernst Lubitsch could write a running joke. But man, it's so funny every because they never seat the person off to the side. He's always like straight right in the middle. In the middle. <laughs> and so like you have to watch. And like the first time he does it, he like sets up the shot really well. So you see him like scooting by people. And you see Jack Benny screaming at him on the yeah. side, just screaming the rest of the soliloquy at him. And it's just amazing because he's like going like scooting through all these people. It's uh, it's just incredible. Another um, great joke like that is I know maybe your favorite joke of the movie, the, oh, God. so they call me concentration camp air. <laughs> well, and it's the, the funniest part of it is just when Jack Benny's doing it, pretending to be Colonel Earhart. Yeah. Because 
he doesn't know what the fuck else he can't improv (laughs) he's got no improv improv skills and so like he's trying to just fill time and he just keeps going so they call me and it's just funny because you're just like can you not fill time in any other way um Um, and then like when they eventually use it again when the actual concentration camp Earhart. (laughs) it's great and he starts doing it yeah (laughs) The other one that's funny is 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 Earhart constantly like getting caught in some buffoonery and then yelling Schultz, just blaming his uh, his secretary, I guess, for for whatever's going on. The the other running joke that was killing me this time that I didn't, I, I mean, I guess I've seen it before. Is every time they somebody gets caught in a web of like, oh, you sound like you're not loving Hitler as much as the other people and oh they start God. like they start fumbling and then they just start going Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler. And like, they're, like, <laughs> they're all doing it at each other like like as this like macho dick wagon yeah. contest of like it's amazing it really captures like that element of fascism that i don't feel like i would understand having not lived through the trump years and and seen the ways in which like trump fandom is like this um almost young male youth culture thing where you're Mm -hmm. you're kind of like one upping the other person on like how much you like trump or like how dedicated you are to uh the maga mission or whatever um it truly is because it's it's always every time they set up that joke and it's funny because the, the jokes works even better because they set it up the first time where they're doing it in the play. So you're just like, oh, it's part of the satire. And then it happens like four more times with that with the actual Nazi. Officers. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's just and it's just because they just will cut each other off and just start hiling Hitler <laughs> <laughs> to show how much they love him um, and to show that they're not being bad Nazis. Um, mm. Yeah, it's. It's it's an interesting movie to watch, I think, um, now because and that's why like my it's not controversial. My opinion, I like I think this is the best of the Nazi like during World War II Nazi satires, mm. you know, among like the producers and the great dictator. Great dictator. Yeah. I think this one's I think this one's good because I think this one's the best because it gets that it's not just, you know, showing Nazis and like making fun of them. Really, it's making fun of like the insecurities and just as as Lubitsch describes it, the ridiculousness of the ideology. And like mm-hmm. that's what it's making fun of. It's not making fun, you know, like Chaplin's spoofing, you know, you know, making Hitler look uh, like this kind of um, cartoonish character. He's making yeah. fun of the aesthetic of Hitler or like the the cult of personality, his, his stage persona. I exactly. Suppose. And yeah. like and then the producers, they're just laughing at um, they're just ha- laughing at like the ridiculousness of of the uh, of the Nazis. And this one, though, I think it's the it's the most effective because it just it's it's all the jokes are built on making fun of their ideology, which is really like the soul right. of what they are. Like that concentration camp Earhart joke. Like it's funny because it's like structurally funny the way that it it kind of pops up in the script in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but also on a deeper level, it is a joke that is displaying like the callousness um, with which these people will laugh about mass death and brag about their participation in mass death because it's just some, you know. Uh, mark of pride in their uh their cool boys club that they're in yeah and and like the the, you know the whenever they're interacting with like Earhart and the other especially him and the other nazi officers it it almost becomes like this like workplace comedy type Mm -hmm. thing you know it's it's not it's not like the third reich invading poland it's like uh it's you know the stuff that they're getting into it's just more like oh my assistant sucks or my assistant doesn't do what he needs to do Mm -hmm. or stuff like that it just kind of just belittles it belittles their state of power that they feel like they wield over people i do think that the nazis are still scary in this movie though um like the the scenes where characters are evading the nazis have a real sense of danger to them 
Um, mm. like the moment when the bomber guy parachutes in and, and has to do a lot of like bobbing and weaving through, through the woods to try to not get, uh, caught by, um, a band of, of Nazi, um, uh, in, um, like, I don't know the name for it. Uh, there's on patrol patrolmen. Mm -hmm. Um, like there, there, that moment feels like it is a scene from an actual like espionage thriller. Um, and, and you get the sense that these characters could die. Um, also, I think that the, the way in which they portray like the bureaucracy and the militarization of these, these organized spaces, the Nazis have constructed, um, is really scary. Um, like when, when the, uh, the the scientist character the you know the british spy character mentions like oh it's it's hard to get in this building but it's even harder to get out mm -hmm. um like because we've kind of gone through all these uh various levels of blockades to to get into that room you do get a sense of that um and and i i'm like kind of on the edge of my seat watching this movie like how are these people going to get out of this uh, yeah because the stakes do feel high well the, the there's a really good it's a very small sequence but there's a good scene when carol lombard's character is waiting for the professor to come back and mm -hmm. in that meantime they've killed him and they send jack benny dressed up as the professor to go there to yeah. retrieve the papers from his trunk to get rid of them um and in you know in transit uh this officer the actual gestapo officer shows up and is you know like where's the professor and she's like oh he's coming back and he's like well can i wait in here and like there and you and carol lombard does a really good job of like kind of displaying this like she knows like they're part of this kind of this whole production thing that they're doing but she like she legitimately like, kind of has this fear on her face because it's just mm -hmm. it's a leering tall you know gestapo man in there who mm. you know if she does one off thing she's you know she's it's it's there's no there's no negotiating um and like it's it's an interesting sequence whenever jack benny's finally shows up as the professor because you see just kind of how tall this officer is kind of leering over her and kind of her mm. clear discomfort with being stuck in this room with this gestapo officer alone um and nowhere she's, else to go also her there with the professor like he's essentially sexually coercing her um and and she's in a position where she can't say no uh because he is surrounded by armed guards like all around mm -hmm. this building who are uh gonna do whatever he says um, well she also runs into it again later with um with colonel Earhart, where he's where she he comes over right. to her apartment and it's just like you know like literally trying to get her to run away with him. And the only way it's broken up is the whole thing where the guy dressed as Hitler walks in and mm -hmm. Earhart thinks that she's going, that she was, she was waiting on Hitler to come pick her up to take her somewhere. Right. So it is acknowledging the, the kind of might makes right um, way in which the Nazis operated. Um, and, and how like, you know, if you were just outnumbered by, you know, all these armed soldiers rolling into your town, you don't really have much recourse, right? Like there's the guy working in the bookstore who has to sell books to Nazi officers coming in and say mm -hmm. Heil Hitler, because these are the people who run the town now. Uh, these are, this is who's in charge. And that's what makes the scene, the, the scene in the, um, in the theater. So moving with the mm -hmm. Felix Brassart character, Greenberg, who pretty much sacrifices himself to let everybody else get through, you know, mm -hmm. and over the course of the movie, he's talking about how he really wants this like impactful role. He really wants this impactful role. Mm -hmm. Like he just kind of wants that, that, that role that people will remember him by. He specifically and wants to play Shylock, the, the Jewish lead in the merchant of Venice. Yeah, he does. And so he, he does the, he does the speech from the merchant of Venice um, as the not, you know, as he kind of breaks away and these Nazi officers corner him. Um, and because he does that, you know, you don't see him again. You can only assume what happens to him, but he mm -hmm. gives this really impassionate speech where he's weaving in this, this, uh, monologue, this soliloquy from, uh, the merchant of Venice, but he's like exuding it through this Polish nationalist, you know, this kind of mm -hmm. resistance to the Nazis. 
I mean, it's a really moving sequence, but then, I mean, he does that and everybody else gets away, but I mean, he's, he's still there because that, that was kind of how the plan was set up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, so, and there's also nods to other political activism happening around them, like the Polish resistance, the Polish underground, like blowing mm -hmm. up Nazi buildings and things like that. Um, and and the movie just kind of being a full-throated endorsement of like yeah fight back against these people any way you can um the only way that these people can fight back against them is with their talent their artistic talent because that's just what they're trained to do um but um you know yeah, everybody kind of has to do something i also like that it's not like a fantasy you know it's not mm -hmm. a great dictator you have chaplain up there at the very end with the famous speech you know looking right. directly in the camera um you know <clears throat> uh inglorious bastards has you know the nazis burning and hitler blowing up and things mm -hmm. like that like this one is not a movie that's that's even though like that's what's it's it's a farce and a satire but at the same time it's not taking anything lightly like they get mm -hmm. away it's not like they save the the day poland's probably a little bit better but it's not completely saved because of what they did all like, they do is keep a specific list of people from being executed exactly and, mm -hmm. and it's kind of just like the it's like a you know a small job but it kept the train moving forward mm -hmm. um and so i kind of like that as well that it's not like this like big sweeping superhero-esque moment of like you know that they saved the day it's like no they just they got themselves to safety and they help save these resistance members who will continue to do what they can to liberate that country. again. Right. And I think the movie makes a really good case for its own existence and it being a movie kind of about resistance and about art and how art can kind of uh, play a role in political resistance. Um, because you know, you, you read a lot of quotes at the beginning of this about people being offended that this movie exists or that it was it was taking it too lightly or whatever. Um, I think there are, you know, plenty of people who would say that this is not, I don't know, um, maybe that making a movie like this is not the way to address the issue of fascism. And, and well, it's especially not, making it in 1942. Especially making 1942, right? And of course, it's not the way like this is not going to be the thing that's going to bring down a, a brutal fascist dictatorship. Um, but I think the movie is going out of its way to make the case for like the value of art as a as a way of fighting or at least, um, you know, like uh, raising awareness of like how fascism works and how other people can fight it. Um, because, of course, there's, there's also. Um, you know, the issue of censorship comes up for half of the movie where they get their uh, play about Hitler uh, shut down mm -hmm. um, because it's kind of considered too politically inflammatory. Um, but the threat is real, right? And like something needs to be said or done about the threat as opposed to just like, oh, we're going to pretend this is not happening and and like not not say anything that would be too controversial. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it's a nice testament to like, just kind of nothing, again, nothing has to be some grand sweeping statement. It can always be just kind of chipping away a, a little bit, you mm -hmm. know, it's, that's something that disappoints me with like a lot of modern art, whether it's television or, or movies or whatever, it kind of like, it feels like it has to it feels like it either has to make a grand statement on something or completely like, you know, make this grand sweeping, you know, this is how we'll solve this issue. It's always like, mm -hmm. you know, there always has to be that at the end. And, and this is, I like this because it's kind of nice because it goes, yeah, like you're not going to solve this with a theater troupe, this Polish theater troupe, who's just kind of trying to, you know, get by it's again, they just kind of chipped away at it. And um, there's nothing wrong with art that just kind of, is a small piece in a larger puzzle. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like everything, I feel like a lot of stuff now, it feels like it has to be like, it has to be meaningful. It has to say something It has to be impactful. And then, and then you get, you know, just kind of similar to what we talked about in the first part, these kind of this, these kind of tasteless, just not tasteless, but just toothless pieces of art that are just kind of trying to 
trying to, you know, ride the wave of being something important and something that is saying, you know, saying what needs to be said. Um, when it could have just been the small piece that just kind of chips away a little bit and that's that's all it needed to do like we're not all yeah. we're not all the heroes at the end of the day sometimes we're just we kind of help out and move along i mean it's the 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 idea of termite art versus white elephant art right yep. white elephant art movies being uh you know movies that seem very impressed with themselves for making these big sweeping powerful important statements uh, versus termite art being a little bit more small scale and personal and specific and and maybe more helpful uh, in its specificity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's. And, and I think I think we just kind of it today we've lost that just not because I, I won't say not because like we don't have artists wanting to do that. It's just that the. Um, it's just that the 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 where we're at business wise with movies, there's just not an avenue for that. It has to be large and grand, or lost on a streaming service. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. there's just not that. There's not that. You know, it kind of is the thing that Ben Affleck has talked a lot about recently. Of just kind of like those adult, middle brow, um, sm smaller movies that would do well. You know, in the in the sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, you just don't have those anymore because they're getting lost in, in streaming services. So I think you just have so much shit co constantly all the time that um, you're you're like, I can't make this kind of small piece of termite art that just kind of says something and then moves along because I have to break through all the other shit to like, mm -hmm. you know, be on the front page of Netflix for a few hours so that people will watch me. Right. Um, and that just kind of soils the whole the whole message and ambition. Did you ever see the interview? Uh, the James Franco, Seth Rogen? Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw it when it came out, so I don't really I, know too much about I it. I have not seen it, uh, but I'm, I'm curious what your memory is of that movie, just because it's the only thing I can think of in recent years that's like directly – taking shots or at least like taking as its subject matter um a currently in power dictator of another country um i remember i think it's it, i remember it being kind of like it's kind of like inglorious bastards for north korea kim jong-il mm -hmm. it's very like like he blows up at the end also mm -hmm. i'm pretty yeah. sure something happens to him yeah or something like that so but yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of like a fantasy wish fulfillment yeah it's very it's very much in the it would be it would be interesting to watch again just because i remember it being very it's just kind of making fun of like oh look at how restricting and terrible this guy is it, but then like the you know it also makes this commentary of like he has all of these um he has all this stuff that you know makes to the very vapid james franco character like oh this guy's actually kind of cool he has all this stuff that i like too um but you know at the end they have to kind of like overcome the dictator type thing um and so i don't remember it being very perceptive outside of just kind of <laughs> making jokes that like oh at least you don't live in north korea right yeah and then blowing up Kim Jong Un. In this, I think you do see Hitler one time, and it's from behind, right? Yeah. Him, him in the uh, the theater box seat, um, and he's presented with grave seriousness, um, as opposed to the slightly more slapstick way that the rest of the movie has has kind of been playing out. Um, and that didn't seem like the vibe of how Kim Jong Il was was portrayed in the interview. <laughs> no, I just it's interesting to think about. It's interesting to look at how America, like, because this is forty two. This is Hitler's been around for a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's not new. Um, and it's interesting to kind of look back at the American film industry who 
you know, like in 42, you got Pearl Harbor's happened, things like that. Like it's, it's kind of engaged. It's like engaged America to a degree so that even though reviewers are being offended by this, you can at least engage with the rise of fascism in Europe. Um, mm on a on a on a hollywood scale that you probably couldn't have five six years before you know five even well, just five years before mm -hmm. um because like we talked about it last week you have something like borzegi's the mortal storm with james stewart and margaret sullivan so good. that is that's actively engaging with it but that's like not many people have watched that that's a very much an outlier and an underseen movie you know mm -hmm. um for the most part the Hollywood wasn't really engaged. You know, this is all happening in Europe. It all, you know, they're invading Poland. They're invading Austria. You know, they're 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 marching around Europe um, and starting to you know attack England. Um, but America's not dealing with it in their movies. You know, we just kind of we we blatantly and so it's just inter more. I mean, America's not dealing with it now. Um, I mean, yeah. we have we have our Eat the Rich movies for sure, but I don't think that mainstream american culture is like really um you know taking seriously what fascism looks like in america and and how that threat is kind of already here i mean the only thing i can think of honestly is unfortunately jojo rabbit which is an awful uh, uh it does it has an awful handling of you know what the evil of the nazis was yeah you know at the same time though um I guess I'm thinking now. I'm thinking of my examples, but they're both. It's not. It, they're not mainstream examples. There really is no. There's really no good. I agree. There's no good mainstream example of how, of how we're handling. You know, handling it. They have the the fucking Trump SNL guy doing the voice of Donald Trump in this she said movie about the Harvey Weinstein stories with the New York times. Like mm, that's, that's the yeah. full engagement that we have. We have the SNL guy doing it. I mean, for God's sakes, we had Alec fucking Baldwin playing Trump for a long, mm. long time. You know, that's the kind of engagement we have on a farce right. level with, with him as a, as a figure. But yeah, I just, I don't know. I think, I think the ant, at least to me, the answer is pretty clear of like how it's happened or at least proliferated in a way that's that shot it to becoming more prominent. You know, I think it was something that was always around in America. Um, oh, for well, sure. For, for sure. But like yeah. it could be it could be qualled just because you just didn't have as many megaphones and with social media and all these other platforms, you're able to kind of megaphone it out a lot quicker. But I just, I think Hollywood movies in the people create, I don't, I just don't, I don't think they, they follow the, I just don't think they understand the, the roots of how of how this was created and caused and how the country itself has played a role and how it handles business and people and other things mm -hmm. like like nobody really captures that and so like lubich is perfect for this because he was living in berlin through the rise like mm -hmm. he understood why people latched on to hitler and why it became what it was right. and so then when he's making this movie he's he's not you know God love Chaplin, but Chaplin wasn't there. You know, mm -hmm. he, he, he was, he, he, even as like a, from a British perspective, he doesn't understand. Um, Mel Brooks understands from like the Jewish perspective, but not necessarily from like the, this is the roots of the ideology. He's more from that Jewish, like, um, you know, the, these, these people trying to eradicate us perspective. And so Lubitsch to me is the most interesting because Lubitsch is going, I saw this, rising i saw this happening i got away from it but like i understand how the machinations work and i think that one thing that hopefully we'll talk about more next week in clooney brown is he sees almost similarly to douglas sirk uh, who is also a, a german uh, immigrant right mm -hmm. uh, he kind of sees the ways in which the 
core like structural dynamics of fascism are still at play in more quote unquote civilized uh, nations like America and England. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Clooney Brown takes place in England. And like that is a movie about somebody who has fled fascism um, and is just kind of like seeing the uh, like the subtle ways in which hierarchy is sort of entrenched into so much of daily life in the West. Um, so we're not as far removed as we like to think we are. Um, and again, like it's going to look different in America than it would look in um, uh, Eastern Europe. Yeah, absolutely. I just, yeah, I just, I, I don't think that America, I don't think American media really does take like an insular look into, you know, how, how did this, how did this happen? Um, because there's kind of a, there, there's a, a degree of an answer to it and we're not immune to <laughs> it's a lot of it is our fault. So it's, but you know, you don't really want to admit that. Um, but there's still kind of a role that, that we play in letting this thing burn on. So mm -hmm. anything else on to be or not to be before we wrap up? Um, I feel like we have wandered away from just how funny and, and entertaining of a movie this movie is. Movie is super funny. It is extremely funny and extremely entertaining, uh, while also being uh, very smart and and heavy throughout. Um, so yeah, it's it I, again, it's a movie you should watch after I think you're already familiar with Ernst Lubitsch on a certain level. Watch Trouble in Paradise. Uh, watch. Um, I don't shop know. Shop around the corner. Watch shop around the corner. Yeah. Um, but this this does feel like a, a really important statement from from Lubitsch. Yeah, and it's it is incredibly funny. Mm -hmm. Like just like top to bottom funny. Yeah. Even even in the serious moments, there are funny moments. Absolutely. Like like you have the whole scene where um they think that they're gonna like trick jack benny who's dressed up as the professor when they find the body of the dead professor and they like so they like lead him in and they're like well, why don't you just go wait in that other room and he like walks in the other room and there's the dead professor there sitting <laughs> in the chair. and then he like and, and then he figures out oh i have this other mustache that fell off that and like replaces oh my it my god the fake and, like, weird scene is so and, like yeah and like they're in there and he's just like oh that's not good for me they're like no it's not looking good for you <laughs> he's like i might he's like i'm liable to get shot for this and they're like you might <laughs> and he's like and he's like well, let's just tug on a beard then he like tugs on the beer and they're just like and then and then the uh the other actors come in and like take him away and like rip off his whole beard and they're just and what what is it they say um you see a man with a beard and you don't tug on it <laughs> <laughs> such a great uh, script it's great um well to be or not to be it's on criterion channel it's on hbo max i, I feel like that's probably the most accessible for people um definitely yeah it's really good i would if you have not seen it um check it out and, and watch some of the other lubich that we've talked i mean again it's christmas season you can watch shop around the corner that's a christmas movie um trouble in paradise i know is also on criterion and, and hbo max as well um watch some lubich and then lubich. watch to then watch to be or not to be it um, all right. Well, that'll wrap up this episode. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary on Twitter and Instagram at handles at cinematary and on letterbox at letterbox.com slash cinematary where we listed all the movies that we talked about in this episode. If you would like to support the show, head over to patreon.com slash cinematary. Um, we appreciate any sort of, any sort of, uh, uh, of donation whether it's five, ten dollars, one dollar, like who, it doesn't matter. We just appreciate your support. Thank you to our patrons, Cam, Chad Newsom, Candace Sisson, Ron Hayes, Teresa Marsathi, Tyler Chandler, and Titus Arthur. Thank you so much for your patronage. Uh, next week, we're going to be wrapping up our uh, Ernst Lubitsch series with, uh, I know, a big favorite of the Java Swaff House, and that is Colony Brown from 1946. My favorite Lubitsch. It's pretty good. Fantastic. It's pretty good. It's a good one. So... Another, another, another real funny one, y'all. Another one, more. another <laughs> real funny one, you know. Um, until then, thank y'all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.